Welcome, everybody, to our show this evening. We are so excited to have everybody here. We have Kip is our guest this evening. How are you doing, Watchful? Oh, I'm doing good. Yeah. Uh, spent some time working <laughs> on the app, trying to get it to work on iOS. Right, Kip, how are you, Kip? I'm good. I'm always good. I'm, I'm just laughing at, at Watchful because there's something about, you know, just sound that it takes a while for it to get to him and then to get back. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was, uh, he may have been distracted just for a second. No biggie. Um, it's um, a lot of interesting things happening today. You know, a, a lot of people are reporting that the solar flare is what took down a lot of the networks, but I don't think that's the case. It, it has all the yeah. hallmarks of a, of a hack, a, a solar flare in, at least the way I think about it, if it was going to take down the cell phones, it would be all of them, not just part of them. And not only that, it took down tons of different stuff. There was a whole list from all the services that went down, everything from Facebook to uh, Twitter was out momentarily. There was uh, AT&T had issues, Cricket had issues, and... My second cell phone, which is interesting, uh, both cell phones are AT&T. One worked, no problem. My, my wife's phone went down. My second cell phone went down. And it was about five hours that they were out. So, interesting. Yeah. So it, it, really, I, it really has all the hallmarks of a hack. And what's interesting is it seemed like they were probing, which in my mind tells me that this was a warm-up. Yeah, mm. it, it kind of reminds me of um, in oh, what is that show called? You know, with the dinosaurs, um, ah, Barney, where the rap, Jurassic where the Park. Ra where the rap, Jurassic Park, where the raptors kept testing and testing the oh, fences, the fences. To see where the weaknesses are. Now, I know you, uh, watchful, are connected to people in the defense industry and and some some folks who are like, you know, high up in the alphabet agencies and I, I have a connection that direction too and he said it was definitely a Chinese hack from his from his connections mm. his connections in, in the one of the alphabet agencies told him it was a Chinese hack and what they were trying to do is is get all these different entities like AT&T to try and get back up so quickly that they would pick up malware and put malware um, into yeah. um, their systems. So this this was about another way to to infiltrate our systems. Yeah, no, for sure. Interesting. I, and I had heard that as well. A uh, matter of fact, I think you put that in the chat earlier, Kip. And it's so important, everybody that's watching. I hope everybody runs a VPN on their cell phones. If you don't, make sure you do. There's a lot to choose from out there. We don't endorse many specific one i use um express vpn but there's there's a lot to choose from but i i feel like in this day and age it's it's critically important and not only do we use uh express vpn but all of my dialogue and chatting doesn't go through a uh, regular uh msm messenger or imessage we we use different services for uh messaging so you know, be be careful. You know, they may not be talking about things right now, but I can promise you that they are data collecting. If you guys have ever watched Monkey Works, he talks mm -hmm. about he talks about the planes that are playing man in the middle between data towers. And I spent a long time on this computer behind me tracking all these intelligence planes. And I used to spend a good amount of time doing it before we started the show. And it's it's a real thing. Uh, you can see in real time all these planes playing man in the middle between cell towers. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the primary objective when you have a VPN on your phone is it encrypts. So there's another location. So and you can usually change location, whether it's in your area or in another country or something like that. And it encrypts all your traffic between you and that location. So and you can change it, too. So, like, if I wanted to, I could. Uh, pick a location that's on the east coast and then my anything that i'm accessing on the internet goes through um 
that encrypted connection to the East Coast and comes out on the end. And what that does is when they have those planes up in the air, when they're trying to do those man in the middle attacks to get yeah. your communications, because it's encrypted, they can't really do anything with it. Same thing happens when you're in a coffee shop. If you're on their Wi-Fi, um, if you're not on a VPN, somebody could l literally watch you entering your username and password into your bank accounts, for instance. Uh, so that's why it's important to always run a VPN on your phone is that it helps in that scenario. Most people aren't aware of the planes that they have up in the air that are constantly doing man in the middle attacks. It's a real thing. It's yep. a real thing. One of my hobbies and something I learned because one of my sub companies uh, was information security. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of what a Wi-Fi pineapple is. I have several of these yep. plus a bunch of the other gadgets that this company offers this thing right here can be dangerous. And what it does is pretty much everybody's cell phone automatically stores the Wi-Fi connection. So like if you go to an AT&T or, or your home internet or really anywhere, uh, with a pineapple, you can replicate those Wi-Fi access points that will automatically your phone will connect to and essentially hand over the keys with no problem. So... Yeah. It's it's a real thing, so I recommend everybody being careful. All right, yeah. next piece of next I piece of news. Yeah, the Hack Five makes some really really cool stuff. Um, yeah. Watchful and I uh, both uh, in our past were very deeply uh, into coding with uh, Kali Linux and stuff of that nature, and it is um, it is very interesting. I know nothing. Uh, Oh, oh, honey! It's yeah. um, I've I've worked I've worked in the enterprise. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's very I've worked in the enterprise with large companies for for fifteen years, and a big part of what we do is defending against. I actually work with a security company presently to this day, and part of what we do is audit uh, enterprise companies for where their vulnerabilities are. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, guys, it's 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 imperative these days to protect yourself. And when I say protect yourself, just make sure your, your information is protected. Cause I know for a fact that they are collecting data on everybody and this will a hundred percent be used in the B system going forward. They, it just, I can't yeah. get into much details about it. Just protect your privacy. Um, someone asked which VPN I use express VPN, but there's tons. You can download them from the app store. Let's see here. Uh, Stephanie, who is a moderator in the chat, she's going to be gone for 3.5 weeks. She's on holiday, so we are going to miss her. Ooh. I just want to let everybody know that she will be on the road and not in the chat, so we will miss her. And so Elon Musk is talking about starting his own search engine that's unwoke. Hmm. It's a, uh, it's a, pretty hot topic just because a lot of people were chatting today about how the current AI search engines are quote, quote, racist and biased. Tim Pool actually did a episode on it today and it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you guys yeah. see any of that? Yeah. Yeah. I caught a little bit of it. I was actually more interested in watching uh, his, he did a uh, video earlier today on the, um, the solar flare slash hacking. Uh, on the internet today, which was what had most of my attention. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But if Elon Musk makes a, a, a un, oh, an unwoke engine, I'm all on that. I love Grok. Grok is the best AI engine. They did well with that on Twitter. So I'd love to see him do something with a search engine. You know, every time I get somewhat suspicious of him, he comes right back with something that seems like it's for the people. I mean, he really uh, pushes back hard on a lot of this stuff. So it's very difficult, even though, you know, you get suspicious of things. He's constantly striving uh, what appears to be for our better interests. You well, know, there, are, there are what the Bible would, would say is a Cyrus. And a Cyrus is a opposition king or person of great power that the Lord uses to advance his kingdom, whether they know it or not. And uh, mm. Harry S. Truman was a Cyrus in bringing 
uh, in, in acknowledging Israel, as was Trump is in, is in acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital. Um, they, they may or may not know that they're being used of God, but he can do that, and he does it often. Hmm. Yep. So uh, a bill that is currently in the Senate. It's a, a bill that it, its plan is in place to divide the United States into 10 districts. This will be implemented mm. by FEMA in the event of a martial law. And this prospect is, prospect is pretty alarming. It uh, kind of reminds me of the Hunger Games. But the, the concept yeah. is, is if... You know, there's a pandemic or anything where they have to lock down society. Each of the 10 districts will have their own FEMA camps that everybody will have to report to. And this is a law they're Ugh. trying to pass. Yeah. They're literally trying to pass this. Um, it's in yep. the Florida's lawmaker right now and um, with the Senate. And I know huh. I told you guys this before, but... Uh, years ago, I was taking a two-hour flight from El Paso to Dallas, and out in the middle of nowhere, Texas, it wasn't very long after we took off, I saw what I knew was the starts of a FEMA camp. It was huge, and there were roads. Everything was squared off. There were roads. There was, there were like almost, it looked like neighborhoods. But the weird thing was it wasn't like it was built for houses. It was built for giant warehouses. And there were trucks going in and out. They were actually building the, the road structure and that kind of thing. But I, the Holy Spirit in me just knew, and I remember looking out the window seeing this, and I thought, oh, my God, there's the concentration camps. And here's the cool thing. Mm. You cannot find this anywhere on Google, Google Sky. It's nowhere to be found. You can look anywhere. Now, we all know that they can cover those things up. So when somebody puts yep. in coordinates or whatever, they they get an old picture or whatever. For I sure. know what I saw, and I know what the Holy Spirit told me it was. I knew immediately that that was the concentration mm. camp or the FEMA camp. I knew it. And there's more of them that people are unaware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, old military bases are, are also... Uh, good candidates for that. Yeah. Anytime I see anything that's separated by seven or 10, it gets my attention, especially when it affects large groups of people. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure if anybody watched what I shared on our Facebook page the other day about Phil Schneider and his research and, and investigation and personal experience with the Dulce base uh, deep underground base episode. It was actually really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I've seen it before, um, but this was one of the first times I really paid a lot of attention to exactly what he was saying. And I did not know this, but these bases are two miles under the ground. Two miles. Nice. Not 200 feet. Not 1,000 feet. Two miles. And... Mm. This has been confirmed by other family that I know that they, they actually have these bases because he was a contractor that was specifically um, put in place. He had the special uh, ability to build and dig in these areas. And one thing that he was explaining is at the time when he was reporting this, and this was in the late 90s, there was 131 of these deep underground bases. And they were uh, all... Yeah, that's, there was, that's more than two per state. <laughs> Yeah, two per state, and they are all connected yeah. via tunnel system. Yeah. And the technology that they use to get to and from them is very interesting. They use a, a magnetic train that moves at two, a Mach 2. That is extremely fast. Mm. Um, wow. And I was digging into it, and it is such a thing as these magnetic trains. Uh, China has one in their region. But two miles underground. I mean, that's wow. that's hard to think about. Two miles. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. not sure if you guys in the chat had looked at that post that I made on Facebook. It was extremely interesting. It was a really good video worth watching. And he went public because his partner and his friend 
had been eliminated by the agency. And apparently there was 13 attempts on his life. He had lots of proof for it. And he was getting ready to release all the locations of all 131 camps. And within four months, he was found um, by suicide. And he said when he was releasing these that to make sure everybody understands I'm not suicidal and you'll, they'll probably find me saying that I off myself and they did. So, um, mm -hmm. it was sad. And if you guys want to look into Thanks. it, you spell Dulce, D U L C E, a quick YouTube search and, or a Google search, either one will get you some great information on Dulce. Um, and the native Americans that live there in the community right outside that base, their interviews are chilling. I would, um, just to add to that, I would recommend looking at that on Rumble. A lot of the Google mm -hmm. and YouTube stuff is censored and they really take it out of the search engine. If you're really interested in it and know how to get there safely, um, on the dark net, there is a lot of information. But if you are doing that, you need to be well protected. Don't don't use computers at your house. Make sure that you're on a VPN. Be very careful if you do that, but I'm not going to elaborate on that. You guys have anything to add before we uh, move on to Kip's idea and presentation? Uh, nope, I think we're good. All right. Kip, what you got for us tonight? I know we're going to be going back and forth about the rapture and you have evidence to support your theory, which is, you know, I hope that you're right. Oh, man, me too. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't want to be here We're all for rooting that. for you, Kip. Come on, knock I it know. out of the park. <laughs> well, you know what? The thing is, I can see all three. Um, but uh, I think it's important that we make a case for each one of them and let people decide. And yeah, so yeah. I just happen to have already on my computer the case for the pre-tribulation rapture. Sweet. I have never really gone through for mid, although I've got, you know, I can talk to mid-tribulation people and go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that, you know, and then, you know, um, and like, let's just be honest, Jews, even Messianic Jews do not believe in a, a pre or mid tribulation rapture. They don't, they believe everybody goes through the, uh, tribulation together and that those who are alive at the very, very end, which will be very few people will be raptured in body. And that's what a rapture is. The, a, a rapture is in the body. And that's the one thing that I disagreed with our guest last night about is because the 144,000, it doesn't say that they're raptured up in their body. Most of them will be killed for their testimony. And the martyrs, they're in, their souls are underneath. They, they don't have bodies. They're dead. They're martyrs. So a rapture is when you're taken physically, bodily up into heaven. So yeah, your um, spirit. That was that. Was, well, your, your body and spirit. Huh, really? The body too? That, yeah. Yeah, huh. that is what a rapture yeah, it says is. we're changed, right? Really taken. Yeah. And and I got some great information on that. Not going to share it tonight, but we could definitely have a great roundtable discussion on cool. our bodies in heaven. And and we can maybe do that next week because it's it's really, really cool stuff. Um, but anyway, so so that's the deal. Uh, so first, I'm going to be making kind of the. I'm going to show you some some scriptures that point to a a pre wrath. Uh, we're not meant for wrath, pre tribulation rapture, and then we're going to look at the Galilean wedding feast and what was Jesus saying in that? Because there were people, a lot of people in the chat, actually more than I I ever expected last night, that said I don't see a rapture at all in the Bible. Okay. That's me. So, mm. so we'll we'll take a look at the Galilean wedding feast because uh, prophetically Jesus spoke in parables, and a third of the Bible is prophecy. So it's hidden, it's masked, um, it's it's not in the black and white. And if you're used to, you know, if you need to have a Bible verse that says, "And then they were all raptured bodily before blah 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 blah," well, then you're you're gonna miss what is really there. So I, now we're, I'm going to try and share my screen with you. I have not used PowerPoint in a very, very long time, you guys. And so if this doesn't work, I'll just go straight to um, 
I will go straight to my, uh, just my scriptures. Yeah, I don't see your second screen uh, available yet. There we go. While okay. you're, while you're, well, you can work on it for a second. Oh, I was wait gonna... a minute. You know what? I gotta, I gotta hit the, come to think about it. Let me do this. I gotta uh, share my screen first. Well, I'm going to let you uh, sort that out just for a second because J-Mod made a, a, uh, a good comment which reminded me. I shared a post on Facebook earlier about the evidence of the Fallen Watchers. It's on our Facebook page. If you haven't watched that video, man, that is good. It is so good. They, uh, there was a marker, uh, a stone tablet on the top of Mount Hermon where they had, uh, it was carved by, they think, by the original Watchers and their oath to essentially change the genetic bloodline to prevent the birth of Christ. We'll talk about that episode another time, but it's on our Facebook page. Yeah. It's so worth watching. It was so oh, good. Wow. And the one thing that really stuck with me is that since then, the UN has built a outpost there and no one is allowed up there. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, your screen's working. Suspicious. Yeah. Okay, so do you see my whole screen, or do you just see uh, the one that says the case for the pre-trib rapture? I just see a white screen. Okay, and it's got prophetic picture pictures of escaping the wrath to come? Are you there? Wh whoops. No picture. Sorry, Lost I'm muting myself. No, I'm here. There you are. Uh, there's yep. no pictures, Kip. It's just a white screen. It says nope. on the air you're in the broadcast. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're, nope. you're sharing uh, the browser tab for. Uh, I think you just need to change your tabs, or you're sharing your browser. I'm sharing my browser. Oh, there you go. Whoa. Well, th well, there goes your infinity yeah. screen. We're looking okay. at Inception there. <laughs> Tell you what, uh, let's not uh, deal with this. Well, you could take a second to figure it out. It's not a big deal. You let us uh, know if you get. Um, that's where, okay. When, let's, let's when just you click on, on your, your sharing screen, screen. There's, there's three options when you click on share screen. You can either share Google Chrome and you can pick the tab that you want to share specifically. Um, and But at the top there, you can share also a window. Um, so I there's three little to, options up there. Yeah, I was trying to do the window, but it wouldn't do it. So guess what? We'll what just works? I'll just pull out the, the scriptures okay. and it, uh, I really hope to put the scriptures on the screen is what I really hope to do so that everybody would be able to maybe write them down if they wanted to, that kind of thing. So okay, so let's talk about the pre-tribulation rapture. So uh, God doesn't warn us to scare us, but to prepare us. I know I've said that before, but that's that's the way that He He really works, and He's never ever left mankind without a warning. Because he loves us, because he's good. And so he's never left us without a warning. And that's why he had prophets and prophecy is to warn us, right? So uh, Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, they are prophetic pictures of the rapture of the church. Uh, because it was before wrath or judgment were poured out. So Noah prophesied and begged the people for 120 years. Repent, repent. Um, he built a boat despite never once seeing a drop of rain because God told him to, right? So, but God had warned him because he loved him. And, and everyone who went through the door of that ark was saved and the Lord shut the door behind them, right? So, and then they sat mm -hmm. there for seven days before the rain came. Seven days. Hmm, they sat there? They sat there for seven days waiting for that's the not how the That's not how the Hollywood movie went. <laughs> no, it's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how the scripture goes. So no, no, I get it. Seven days I was... that they sat there and waited. Right. So remember that seven days. And and think about this. The Lord shut them in. Uh, one more fun little fact that we forget about or we, we don't know about Noah's Ark is it says that um, that he put put it together with uh, gopher wood and pitch. The Hebrew word for pitch that is mm -hmm. used there is redemption. It means redemption. Huh. 
Isn't that cool? That is so cool. anyway, so the Lord shut them in. And, and so he warned them ahead of time and he allowed Noah to warn everybody, but they didn't listen. Right. right. There probably weren't a lot of them left that weren't, you know, mixed blood or something like that. But still, only him and his family were saved. So they were saved from the wrath to come. Right. So now the book of Yasher has something very interesting to say on this topic. And in Yasher 5, 5 through 6, it says, All who followed the Lord died in those days before they saw the evil which God declared to do upon the earth. So in that 120-year span, Yasher says the good people who believed in God died off because God did not want them to go through what was coming. Hmm. So, yeah, so that's an interesting thought. So God made sure that the righteous were not part of that judgment. Well, let's look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, when the Lord could only find Lot. What, what's your as, scripture you're at? I'm trying to follow you. Oh, I was at uh, Yasher, the book of no, Yasher, which is the, the one you're No, the one you're working in right now. Oh, Genesis 19, 13 through 21 is where I'm going. Okay. Got it. So we're going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so when the Lord could only find Lot among the righteous of Sodom, okay, he didn't destroy Lot. He sent the angels to warn him and remove him and his daughters and his wife, but his wife, you know, actually, he went and he pleaded with his sons-in-law and yeah. they told him he was crazy. They told mm -hmm. him he was crazy. We're not coming with you. Right. So, so Genesis 19, 13 through 21 says, and, and he said, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow the city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. So the angel who was sent said, and, and this is interesting to me, I have favored you concerning this thing also. Okay, so which angel is this? Is this the capital A angel of the Lord speaking? Who is Jesus? What angel is this? But he said, see, Lot, I've favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow the city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. So he's, he's telling him, I can't do, I can't bring judgment until you're gone. Okay. This angel is sent there to bring judgment, but as long as Lot's in the city, he cannot do it. So anyway, interesting, uh, the word says Lot and his daughters went up to Zoar. So they ascended mm. up a mountain. They went up. So in a way, they are raptured. They are taken up. Just like, you know, if you think about it, so with the ark, um, when the waters came, that would have been lifted up, right? Okay. So let's look hmm. at Jericho and Rahab, and that's Joshua 6.23. Now, Rahab and her family were rewarded for her faith. She's the one that had the faith to say, hey, you know what? Um, we've, we've been watching you guys come across the desert towards us, and we know that you're here to take our land, and we know that your God has done all kinds of amazing miracles for you. And I believe that your God is God. So I'm going to help you. And she was rewarded for that faith. She was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. She was rewarded for her faith. She and her family were escaped, escaped the wrath to come. And that's Joshua 6, 23. And young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp. So if God wants, God wants none to perish. He really does. He loves his humanity. Um, and he even gave Jericho seven days to repent. Did you guys realize hmm. that? I mean, it's crazy. So Joshua 5, 13, through 14 is where the commander of the Lord's army shows up, right? And Joshua's out taking a walk and he decides, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to seek the Lord for a battle plan. And as he's out there, he sees this man in this, this long white robe with this golden sash. And he says to him, 
are you for us or for our adversaries? And the man said, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army, who is Jesus, said to Joshua, take your sandals off your feet. The place you are standing is holy ground. Okay, the only, the only person who can say that is God Almighty himself is Jesus. Take your sandals off your standing on holy ground. So he is there with Jesus. And what did Jesus say when he said, are you for us? Are you for Israel or are you for, for Jericho? And he says, neither. Think about it. They walked around that place for seven days, giving that town, those evil, evil people, the option to repent. And they never did. Nineveh repented, but Jericho did not. So, so there's what? that seven again. Where does it say that the uh, he was talking to Jesus? Well, take a look at this. Uh, he said the the commander of the Lord's armies. Who is the commander of the Lord's armies? What does it say in Revelation twenty four? That's Jesus. Okay, and take off your your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. Angels don't say that. Right. Only Jesus says that. So that what is verse Jesus. are we in? We're in Joshua 5, 13 through 14. Yeah, okay. I'm reading it now. Um, but he says, neither. I'm not for you. I'm not for them. Didn't he receive, didn't he receive power them. and authority after? Didn't but, he receive but, power and authority after his ascension, though? So my thoughts is it was just God that he was dealing with. Yeah. Um, he is the word. Joshua... Yeah, he, he is the word. He is the creator. Um, he I, is who he is, and he is the commander of the Lord's armies. You would think that maybe that person is Michael, but Michael does not say, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. No, I get it. I, just, uh, I guess our positions differ because in my mind, God and Christ, God and Jesus are two different entities. They are. Yeah. They are three so, in one. So, so, but this is, this is, this is the commander of the Lord's armies. This is Jesus. He's the warrior side of God. God, the father is the father. He's the soft side of God. He's, he's the, the one who wants to love us and take care of us and provide for us. Jesus is the warrior. He's the tough guy. When he came to earth, he came to represent the Father. He didn't come as himself. We think of Jesus as, oh, you know, Mr. Kumbaya and heal this person. He was only doing what the Father told him to do well, because he represented his Father, not well, himself. Well, you know, it, thinking about it, you're probably right because in heaven, time is not linear like it is on earth. So... Uh -huh. When he came, you know, it's it's not the same. It's a linear fashion through our physical life here on the planet where it's not the same on the spiritual side. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. See, he's, he, you know, for lack of a better word, he wears a lot of hats. But stop and think hmm. about this. Um, before Jesus came and modeled the Father, there was no thought in the Jewish people's mind of God being a father. There's very little said in the Old Testament where God is portrayed as a loving father. They just thought of him as a judge and they were always in trouble. So what Jesus came to do by representing the father was very revolutionary. The people were able to see a good dad, someone who loved them, not just who judged them. And that was really revolutionary. So right here, we've got Jesus as the commander of the Lord's armies, which is really who he is. Um, and we see that a lot in Revelation. <laughs> so now let's look at Elijah. This is going to be fun, guys. You were, this is going to be a fun one to talk about, too. So now we know that Elijah was taken up in a chariot what of verse? fire. Okay, we're looking at 2 Kings 2, 2 through 3. Okay. So everybody turn there, 2 Kings 2, 2 through 3. Okay, so it says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, 
that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elisha said, then Elijah, I'm going to call him Elisha because that's what they call him on The Chosen. And you can get mad at me for watching The Chosen. I don't care. <laughs> so then Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha, and they said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And Elisha said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. What? We, th we are only told in Sunday school and, and from the pulpit about, you know, uh, Elisha and Elijah standing there, and Elijah gets taken up in this, this chariot of fire, and he drops his, his mantle down, and, and uh, Elisha picks it up, and now he's got this double anointing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, you're, is... you're, you're blowing back into your mic big time. You're, um... Oh, am I? Yeah. There we go. Is that better? There you go. Yeah. Yep. All right. So, so uh, where was I? We're, we're only told a little bit of the story, but this is really important here, where the, the prophets, the school of the prophets, all the other prophets that, that Elisha or Elijah is not necessarily hanging out with, but there are more prophets, and they kind of stick together um, in this school of the prophets. They come out and they say, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you? How did they know? that Elijah was going to be raptured in bodily form. God must have told him. God must have told him because Elijah wasn't around them. He was with Elisha, but they knew. So God prepares us. He warns us. Obviously, Elisha knew. How he knew, I don't know. But we, he warns us. So... Now, there are two warnings to the end times generations, and one of them is in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4. 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4. Know this, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is this promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all these things continue as they were from, begin from the beginning of creation. I mean, don't we hear that a lot? Oh, well, if the Bible was true, it would have been fulfilled by now. Oh, well, you guys talk about this rapture. Well, it hasn't happened, so it probably isn't. Where is your God? He must not love you. He hasn't come for you yet. We we hear people scoff at the thought of a pre-tribulation rapture. We hear people scoff at the thought of a mid-tribulation rapture. And there are plenty who scoff at a rapture at the end, even though it clearly says we are taken up, or those who are alive and reigning are taken up, right? So, so that's the deal, is scoffers will come. We are warned that scoffers will come. And if scoffers come and they tell us, your God isn't good, and if he hasn't come by now, he's not coming, uh, shouldn't we be prepared in our hearts to stand against that? And then Luke 21, 28 is now when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. You know, we're told to look up. Why are we told to look up? Are we looking for somebody to come get us out of the sky? <gasps> you know, so, so that's, that's one of the, the things that I always think about. Now, do you guys have any questions about any of that? What do you got, Watchful? Yeah, so let me summarize what it is. Yeah, let me summarize what it sounds like you're saying. So it sounds like you're saying that because the pattern is that before a disaster or tribulation comes, God warns and prepares those who will, those who will be left behind and those who, who will be removed. Is that, am I understanding what your, what your point is up to yeah. this point? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. It, it, as far as as far as Lot and the you know Noah and the Ark, um, that does that's not a rapture in my eyes. They were they simply you know they may have gone up, but they um, that's not how I you know I could be wrong. Um, yeah. But, no, they didn't uh, go up to heaven. They didn't go up no, to heaven. But it is a prophetic picture of a rapture. So. 
Um, and yeah, that's so they something were removed that we, we from, have to be able to do. They were well, removed from yeah, harm. They were removed from destruction, wrath, harm, tribulation, whatever it is yeah. you want to call it. Uh, the point seems to be that, that they were they were warned and removed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. Uh, Elijah was definitely uh, raptured. He, mm -hmm. he, you know, supernaturally went up to heaven without dying. Yep. Yeah. Body and I, but and I think his... Yeah, his his rapture is different from ours because my understanding is our body well, that we will be changed because the dead in Christ rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will be changed and uh, ca caught up to meet him in the air. Right where Elisha, Ja with a J, uh, was taken away on a chariot. So he, for what we know about the record, he wasn't changed. He was taken away as he is. So there's yeah, and, a, and a we don't know at what point you're changed. You know, when you meet him in the right. air someplace, I don't know. He could have been changed. I don't, we don't know. And what I, what I do know is yeah. a lot of people will say the same thing about Moses, that Moses was raptured, but the Bible clearly says that God buried him. And he all, right. and it also says that yeah. Michael says he died. and, yeah. Um, and there were Satan a lot of people in the body. chat last night. Yeah. That Satan fought over his body. Okay. Uh, so, but there were a lot of people mm -hmm. in the chat last night that absolutely said that Moses was raptured. Well, he, he was no, not, he his wasn't. body was buried. And you got to wonder why, you know, why you guys think right. that, that God buried his body? Uh, well, because he had made a proclaim, my understanding is he had made a proclaimment that Moses would not go into the promised land. And the fact that, that Michael and Satan were fighting over his body indicates that there was the potential for that body to be moved. So, you know, in my mind, I'm wondering if Satan couldn't have picked him up and put him in into the promised land and in stark violation of what God had commanded. That was just the thought that that's, kind of hit my mind. That's yeah. a good thought. Yeah. And Enoch, um, I think he was raptured more than once because he went up, consulted with, God came back down and talked to the watchers and let them know, uh, okay, you guys are done. And then <laughs> yeah. went back up there to try to change God's mind. God said, kick rocks, not happening. They're dead. <laughs> you sure and, did. <laughs> and, you know, so, but uh, Elijah, they said it was a fiery chariot. That could have been a spaceship. And that's just what they did. I love that one. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. We're gonna. Go, know, we're just gonna that, call it a spaceship. <laughs> well, and that's Fire that's spaceship. what I would assume personally. A, a chariot of fire would be is what we would call yeah. a spaceship. I mean, when we look at Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel talks about the the throne of God, which is this. It moves in any direction it wants, and it's made up mm -hmm. of four living creatures. The same four living mm -hmm. creatures that go around his throne, singing "Holy, Holy, Holy," right? And they somehow come together like a transformer, and they make his throne out of their bodies. God's tech is so cool that it's biologic. And yeah. that, that is a chariot yeah. of fire. One of the wow. NDEs yeah, that I watched. far beyond technology. Oh, yeah. yeah one, of the, one of the NDEs I watched, uh, the, the guy physically said that he watched the four cherubs that were next to the throne pick up God and bank off like a helicopter and took him somewhere. What? Yeah. It, like, oh, uh, that's so cool. Yeah. It was pretty neat. Um, so it, no, no, you're right. You know, who knows what the technology is like, but it's clear that it is. And yeah. it's, um, well, especially it's, if the angels are, if the fallen angels are the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it stands to reason that they have knowledge that supersedes our own. So oh, for sure. And, and I love, I love the timeline that with the Tahu Vubahu in the, in the Genesis yeah. account where the earth became mm -hmm. without form and void, because that leaves yes. a period of time that that's where the angels could have come from. And who knows how long that they were in existence before it became without form and void. I mean, they could have, it could have been equivalent or greater. Well, I don't know if it could be greater than where we're at today with knowledge and technology, because oh, the yeah. great tribulation says that the great tribulation says it will, it will never be as bad 
during that great tribulation and it will it never has been that bad and it never will be that bad so that kind of puts a limit on how bad it could have been with the and uh, technology the but and, and technology but, yeah, but will that advance. point is is yeah the, the the point being is um who knows how long they existed and had you know god could have just gave them the you know the the maximum technology or they or they could have had a period of time to develop it themselves uh, before it, the the fall of the angels and before the earth became without form and void. <clears throat> yeah. hmm. Well, here here I've got a theory on that too. So um, and I'll throw it out to you um, because it's it's obvious from Genesis that the earth is a reno. <laughs> this is a renovation, guys. <laughs> a reno. Uh, <laughs> a reno. It's a right. renovation. It was with yeah. It was formless and and God hovered over it and and He rebuilt it. So my here's here's how I see it. I see it that these these fallen angels were in heaven with God. They saw all of His tech. They used His tech. Only God yeah. can create life. And it's obvious from this wheel within a wheel, from this movable throne, that God's technology is living. It is biologic. But a created being cannot do that. And so right. when Satan was cast down to the earth, he's got to use whatever is here on earth to try and rebuild that technology that he sure. saw. He's got the... He's got the the images of it he's got knowledge of it but he needs to use us and our uh, metal etc to right. build it that's why that's why um there are spaceships that they've found supposedly that do not have rivets and that right. do have rivets right. the ones who don't mm -hmm. they're probably more from a heavenly realm than the ones who do have rivets yeah, uh, one of the things that um, Philip Schneider talks about is that, you know, when you're going to school, there's uh, 105 elements on the periodic table, something around that. I can't mm -hmm. remember that exact number, just more. but there's uh, 136 um, elements on the black site table list. So there's like 36 other elements that are not of this earth that they use in their technology but the thing you have to also keep in mind is we don't know how long the watchers and how long uh, all the angels in heaven were good before they had their falling out we know that god created the earth and this timeline in a, a certain fashion but it could have been an inf infinite amount of time that they had been in their celestial body before Earth and this timeline was made. Mm -hmm. you, you ever think That's about right. that? Yeah, we, we don't have a clue. Yeah. So when they when they had yep. their falling out and they came to Earth, I'm sure they had a really good idea how the tech worked. And like Kip said, because it was made by God, they had to improvise here on Earth with what materials they had available to them, which is why... They had advanced technology, which is how they and it and it should be ahead. pointed out that we know that they didn't know everything because in the book of Enoch it talks about God hadn't revealed to them the entire plan that He had for you know His creation, uh, which is a, a, and which is one of the reasons why they actually fell. And that's a good indicator that their knowledge wasn't infinite, but it was limited, which goes to your point of they would have had certain knowledge that we didn't have in a new creation. Uh, that's why they were trying to teach metalworking and teach, uh, you know, astrology, uh, astronomy, astrology. No, they were the ones teaching astrology. They were teaching the, like the witchcraft version of yeah, it. Yeah, big time witchcraft. Yeah. Well, yeah. In, in the, in the, the, the lust of the of the eyes and, and things like that uh, because they didn't know any better. They didn't have a full comprehension of what the whole plan was. Mm -hmm. They knew enough yeah. that, that God's plan was to have a, a savior on this planet. And they knew yes. that it would well, come. Did they? Yeah. It's, it, it talks about it at Enoch, which is, it was their main motivation. Oh, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. They, they actually do talk about that in the book of Enoch. And mm -hmm. the, their main motivation of having um, sex with the, the women was to dilute the seed line, 
because they yeah. knew that mm. Jesus would come from um, the humans. So that was their whole purpose was to foul uh, I thought they I thought they were just attracted to the woman. Women. I think they use that as an excuse, but in Enoch, it goes into much greater detail. The Genesis, mm -hmm. you know, it says that, yes, they, they like the women and blah, blah, blah. But in Enoch, it talks about the pact they make on the top of Mount Hermon yes. and their right. plan. And they all had to agree to it because it would be such a grievous sin. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the case of Misery Loves Company, where St. Anael said, you know, I fear that I will be the only one who does this. You guys have to do it with me. And they exactly. said, okay. Right. Sim Jaza was like, yeah. look, if we're going to do this, we're all doing it together. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. So. Yeah, yeah Misery mm. Loves Company. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting. Science actually even proves that theory, too. We talked about this a little bit with Ben because he had mentioned that they can see from the layers of the earth flipping that it's been flipping, you know, er, more often, like every 12,000 years, I think, is there, that cool? there's a cycle yeah, where it flips. So who knows how long it was doing that? Because I know that there, there's a the young earth theory is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's only 6,000 years old, but that doesn't quite jive with the, the scientific evidence that we have where we have the layers that we can see and, the, and there is reliable time dating. Not all time dating is reliable, but there is reliable time dating and it suggests that it's been going back and forth in 12,000 year cycles. So, and the way that that fits in the scripture is in that Genesis when it became without form and void. So the tahu vu bahu, and if you're not, if you don't know what we're referring to, just type in that that phrase into um, Google. I'm sure you'll come across the teaching to who vu bahu. It's uh, Genesis one, one through like three and four. It's like and the earth became without form and or it says I think the English most English translations is the earth was without form and void. In other words, it's indicating that God created it without form and void. But when you look at the actual Hebrew. The Hebrew basically says that it became without form and void. And that's where that period of time fits that, you know, the earth could be actually older than just 6,000 years. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that it is, but I don't think it's billions of years like they say. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to, to back up what you were saying, uh, Watchful, is... If you guys go to skywatchtv.net, skywatchtv.net, Donna Howell and Tom Horn have a a book on the subject of tohu bohu, however you say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's called the, it's about the chaos dragon, and and it's it actually uh, really studies in depth exactly what we're talking about. And it's funny because we were talking about um, all of this, you know heaven's technology and what did the the fallen angels bring well we were talking in in the news segment about the dumbs the deep underground military bases what do you think's happening mm -hmm. down there today oh well you know it, that, who, do you, who do you think that they are getting their their cool tech from oh for Way sure two, mm -hmm. two miles underground yeah yeah it, it, which reminds me um so should I go into this? It's kind of long-winded. It's about the the smell between. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll save that for another time because that's long-winded. That I, I get a sidetracked. <laughs> Anyways. I'll tell you okay. what. Let's let's talk again about the rapture really quick. Sure. So, um, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah we have it. Some, some more, just a little bit more proof that there is a rapture. I mean, we look at the fall of Babylon the Great, and that's Revelation eighteen twenty-three. Um. And it says, the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, Babylon. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. So right. the bride and the bridegroom are not there. And in Daniel 12, 1 through 3, um, you know, at the time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble since never was seen um, since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. So there will be a rapture. There will be a deliverance. When? Mm. We can debate that all night long. Um, 
And it just sounds like the sounds like the second uh, the return of Christ. It it, yeah. it, it doesn't sound like well, um, a pre trib okay. rapture. Well, if you if you just what were you, which who's going to be left? Who is going to be left at the end? Uh, very very few people. That's not deliverance. A, a little tiny remnant is all that gets delivered. That's yeah. And at the, yeah, well, that's a good point because every, if he doesn't, everyone who is found written in the book, it doesn't say everyone who's left over. No, if I mean you make a good survive. point no. because I think we're all I think we're all in agreement on that because we know the dead in Christ mm -hmm. rise first. So the uh, yeah. so are we debating the who who are actually alive? Um, that that portion that who those who are alive live and remain. Uh, is, well, is, is, is that who we're talking about? It to the end of the tribulation. Yeah, I, I and, think Kipps makes and, a good point though because he has to cut it short or no one survives. Yeah, correct. And so at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone, everyone who is found written in the book, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's not just this little tiny remnant. There's a lot of people delivered. It's it's right. a because it's everyone found written in the book. Right. So and, and we know it's and we we know it's innumerable because um, God told Abraham, "Look up at the stars, and if you can count the stars, that's how vast your your seed will be." And we also know that the number under the altar is un is uncountable. So we know it's a huge group mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Go cart Bob in the chat. I know that the rapture is not in the Bible, but everybody knows what it means. We don't really care to get legalistic on here. We yeah. call it rapture. Who cares? Yeah, everybody well, knows what actually, we mean. Well, yeah. actually, there, there's a Greek word that we're going to get to here. It's called harpazo. Right. Okay. And that word harpazo is rapture. It's taken up. It is caught up. That's no, what it is. I, I get it. Just the actual, so, the actual see, spelling we, we, word is not in the book, but everybody knows what we yeah. mean. Yeah. Well, but, and here's the thing. The Bible was not written to 21st century Gentiles okay. in America. It was written to Jews, Jews who spoke Hebrew, mm -hmm. Jews who spoke Greek, because they did. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's what we need to look back to. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's not in the Bible. Uh, is the word homosexuality there? It's not. Nope. Is the word dinosaur there? It's not. But nope. clearly those things are in the Bible and they're spoken of. So um, I am going to show you the prophetic picture of the rapture here We're pretty soon. We're getting to it. So, um, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. Okay? That sounds so like that's the return the changing, of Christ. So that's yeah, that the changing like the of our body. Trumpet. It, at the last it could trumpet. Be the so seventh, that... It could be the first. Well, it said the last, the last trumpet. trumpet. Numerous trumpets. Yeah. No, it so, said the last trumpet. Okay. I think so the argument on that, the argument on the pre-tribulation version of that, is that what you're going to get into, Kip? Is, the arc is for Revelation the Festival of Trumpets? Revelation well, for the one. Festival of Trumpets? Yeah, oh, you're referencing... Yeah, the you're Feast referencing... There's the Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah, and there's also mm -hmm. Revelation 4.1. Well, the, it's referencing the, the Church of Philadelphia, and they're spared from the wrath, but it's not spared from tribulation. No, the, we're, we're in a different section. So oh, we're, we're, we're talking about yep. the last, yeah, yeah, we're talking about the last trumpet. Yeah, like, uh... so there's, two, there's at least <laughs> two interpretations of the last trumpet. All right, sorry. Okay, well, okay, at the last trumpet. The trump shall sound, the didn't... Uh, and the mortal was, will put on immortality. And we can talk about that another day, about what kind of bodies we're going to have in heaven because the Bible That's gonna be actually awesome. does tell us. And it tells us in Hebrew, not in English, like we want to hear it. It's in Hebrew. So if you, if you do not dig, if you do not look, you won't know. You won't know what's really there. So... So then this corruptible has put on incorruption and the mortal has put on immortality. And then we, it shall be brought to pass 
that the saying is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? So basically, there are people who will be raptured up, taken into heaven bodily, who never, never die. When right. that is, there's lots of scriptures. Some of them point here, some of them point there. We're trying to figure it out. So, no, you're right. You're right about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then First Thessalonians four sixteen through eighteen, um, it's kind of a mirror of that because we've got Thessalonians and Corinthians, and and Paul wrote both of those, and so they kind of jive. They're a little different. They're kind of similar, and it says, "For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God." So there's the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. So I, I find it comforting to think you're going to come sooner than later. <laughs> that's what I find comforting. Well, yeah, and I think that's why we all, we all hope for it. Uh, yeah. I think the argument for, for that, though, is those who have already died. Like, cause I know mm -hmm. thousands of people who, you know, expected to, you know, that it's like if we're in that period of time that they would make it, but there's so many people who haven't. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how many people have died over the 6,000 years. That's a ginormous number. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, even just, and, even just since Jesus, since this was, this was missed uh, or since this was mm -hmm. written. And there are actually those who, who do not take it back that far. And there's, there are arguments that people make that this is only from the time of Christ forward, that, that the people who are dead in Christ, it says are dead in Christ will rise first. So those are believers in Christ. That basically cancels out anybody before yeah. Christ who didn't. And so, so there's an you'd have argument to, on that too. Boy, yeah, do you'd we have like to, to argue. ignore the yeah, you'd have to ignore the book of Enoch that talks about the place of holding and the spirits that are uh, destined to roam the earth. So we know there is a separation from a physical body. Uh, so I don't think that they go to complete destruction or cease to exist. I, I don't think that's a very good argument. Now, there's souls. No, Everybody and, and has a soul except the fallen about. angels. Yeah. But but the, uh, the, the argument that I hear from the pulpits... Uh, especially in the Baptist mm -hmm. church with this, the dead in Christ shall rise first. They, they believe that the dead in Christ are believers from the time of Christ to now rise first. And so that would be the pre-tribulation oh. rapture to them. And then oh, I see those what you're saying. Who are in I see the qualifier. Places. Yeah. The qualifier yes. is the dead in Christ. So I thought about that. it's not the that the argument. dead proceed. It's not that the dead proceed. It's not that all the dead proceed those that are living. It's the dead in Christ. Just the believers first. that die. So they're the first fruits. So they're the first fruits. That could be what's, no. you know, so for, say, for instance, that April 8th or April 28th, the festival of first fruits, that could be the dead in Christ rise first. And then those who are alive and remain in Christ are caught up together in the air. That could be when the, the two witnesses receive their power and authority to reach those who aren't in Christ and those who die who aren't in Christ. Uh, there could be another rapture after that. That could fall in line with what Brenda was saying. So well, with the, the graves literally the open end, up and the we can we can hope actually well when jesus resurrected the graves literally opened and the dead walked the earth literally zombies are in the bible guys the dead walked hmm. the earth when when christ rose that'll freak yep. some people out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and think about it in the end days uh well in during the tribulation we know that there are people who will wish to die but cannot yeah is that a zombie that's it right could be. yeah I'm going to get more coffee. I'll be right back. Yeah. We were talking about something else, though, there for a second before we got off on zombies. What was it? <laughs> uh, you were in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Well, we had, we had kind of gone and then you on moved a, to first a, Thess Then you went to Thessalonians, oh, I think. Okay. Well, we were talking about the, the, um, the uh, Baptists. 
and what what yeah. they believe in and you know for the, the most part that that you know uh, that the yeah. dead in Christ rise first blah 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 oh okay so you were mentioning the in April there's that festival of first fruits right mm -hmm. um and yeah that would be the perfect time for a rapture and I personally believe I'm sorry and I I did not think I was going to talk on this tonight, so I haven't really pulled it all together. But the 144,000 that are sealed, those are Jews, mm. right? And they are sealed to go out and preach the gospel. From everything so that I can tell, the, they the show up at the same that. time as the, as, the, as the two witnesses. And so they're out there doing yeah. their thing, and, and that they would be slaughtered probably they would probably be martyred just like the the two witnesses are right so they would be unkillable until until the 1260 days is complete and here's the deal we know that israel has has genetically um found their kohens they have found mm. all their they they found their levites or their priests and so are those part of that 144,000 we don't know. They might be, but I find that really interesting that they plan to, to uh, uh, I don't want to say sacrifice because it's not a sacrificial ceremony. It's not. Um, they're going to, to uh, kill their red heifer. They hope to um, uh, during Passover uh, here of this year, 2024, which is uh, July, July, blah, April 20th through the 28th. The 28th, like you said, is the uh, first fruits mm -hmm. and the Cohen's have already been located. So for me, that's like, uh, is this kind of a, is this a fulfilling of what we see in scripture? Yeah, I don't know. So the, the thing with the 144,000 being Jews is you have to qualify what a Jew is because, um, mm -hmm. the Jews don't even know a Jew is like in <laughs> Israel, there's so many different sects of people who mm -hmm. call themselves Jews. And then, you know, even variations of Judaism and what they believe it's, it's, it's as bad as Christianity with the different denominations yeah, and segregations and stuff like that. So I think that's why it qualifies by bloodline out of the tribe mm -hmm. of, so it's 12 tribes. So you and I could literally be Jews according to that definition. We could be part of the 144,000. So here's yeah, the thing, knows? though, that I was thinking about is, is the 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 dead in Christ rise first, and then those who are alive and remain. The question is, is is that before the Great Tribulation, or before, during, or after the Great Tribulation? So there is are that, arguments for all. There's arguments yeah. for all. I mean, That's so really it's so it's funny. It's like we it feels like we have we almost have all the puzzle pieces, and it, we're so close to having like a, a a concrete answer. But I don't think we're going to know for sure until it actually happens. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like we have more today than we had, you know, last year. Well, and one thing that I really like is because you know we're told over and over uh, we won't we can't know the day or the hour we can't know the day. Well, yeah, Jesus said that, but there were two things that he was saying there because. Because he was talking to Galilean Jews. He was talking mm -hmm. to people who spoke his unspoken language. They were from the same place. Um, so when he said that, they understood what he was talking about. We read that and we go and we dismiss it. Oh, well, we can't know. So, and then if anybody right. brings it up, we, we point our fingers. Well, nah, 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 nah. the Bible says we can't know. You're, you're Is that really what setter. Jesus was saying? Yeah. Huh? No, it wasn't what he was saying at all. No. No. So what was he saying? So that's multi-layered. There's, there's more than one answer to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the answers is that he was pointing to the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. Exactly. Which right. is the feast that no man knows the hour or the day. That's literally that's right. what the Jews call it. And it's the Feast of trumpets well we know that this yep. trumpet sounds and then there's you know the dead in christ raised we know that that is that is the p prophetic picture of the rapture whenever that is beginning yep. middle or end we know that that trumpet calls 
calls his church, his bride up. We know that. Um, and the cool thing about why is it called the Feast of Trumpets? I mean, the, the feast that no man knows the hour of the day. Well, that's because there's this little teeny tiny sliver of the moon and the, the priest is out there looking for it. And if it's cloudy or if maybe it comes up during the day and you can't see it, you know, you don't know what time it's going to come up or really where, um, it, not only does he have to wait to see it, then he has to blow the shofar a hundred times. Who knows when that's going to be? What day is that? Is that going to be today? Is it going to be tomorrow? Uh, that's why the feast is two and a half, almost three days long, because they don't know when it's going to start. They don't know. And that's why they call it uh, the feast that no man knows the hour of the day. And that's exactly what Jesus said. No man knows the hour of the day. And then here's another fun thought um, is Luke 17, 34 through 37. I tell you in that night, in that night, remember mm -hmm. that. So, cause, cause he's talking, he's talking to Jews. So in that night in Israel, in Jerusalem, in that, oh, so it's going to be night there. Okay. There will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other one left two women grinding together. One will be taken. The other left two men in the field. One will be taken. The other one left. And they answered, they said to him, where Lord, where are they going to be taken? So he said, wherever the body is there, the Eagles will be gathered together. So he's talking to them about this rapture of the church. One will be taken up and one will be left. So it's a, a private event for individuals. It's not a mass event because one will be taken, one will be left. So, um, and what is this also saying? It's, Two women are grinding together at the mill. That's morning. Okay. Right. All uh, around the world. So the different field. time zones. Yeah. yeah. Two men out in the field. That's daytime. And then two men in bed. That's nighttime. So in, mm -hmm. at all at the same time, it might be, you know, when it's midnight in, in Jerusalem, it's four o'clock in the afternoon in Dallas. So yep. if they get, if, if the rapture comes at midnight in Jerusalem, it's going to be Four in the afternoon here, and it's going to be two in the Which afternoon another, where you're at. A, another one of the reasons why we can't know the day or hour, because it's a couple of days across the zone, across the world. Hey, check this out. So you got me thinking about the Festival of Trumpet, which I've done lots of these videos, you know, in the past, because we there's been a lot of things that look like it was pointing at the Festival of Trumpets uh, in mm -hmm. 2023, 2022, 2021, all the way I just know. going back forever. We all, everybody's, everybody's looking at the Festival of Trumpets like, this is it, it's going to happen. Um, so I, I plugged in the date calculator from April 8th. 2024 to when they currently have the Festival of Trumpets marked in 2027, which again, this is set by the observance of the moon. So they can guess based on um, when they can calculate when the moon can, will be visible, but it's, it's dependent on two witnesses observing right. the new moon independently it's, it's like it has to be certified. So it doesn't go based on when we can calculate it. It goes based on the two witnesses observing the new moon. So, but if we just assume that it's, so they have it marked as Rosh Hashanah 2027 is October 1st, 2027. So from 4 8 to Rosh Hashanah, it's 1,271 days. So there's an 11 day variance there that anything could happen. So it could actually be from April 8th to Rosh Hashanah, which I don't like leaving 11 days on the table. That's why I look at the festival of first fruits because that's a much cleaner calculation because it is actually, mm -hmm. so on the calendar, April 28th, 2024 to October 10th, 2027 is 1,260 days. But if the calendars are wrong, and it's based on the moon, which, you know, based on maybe the eclipse, then it could be on four eighth. But I don't I don't think I'm probably so. not. I don't know either. I know. But it's it, the, I just can't get over the especially. eclipse that's in Pisces. The eclipse is cutting the chain. It's like it's removing yeah. the restrainer. Well, you know, who's so going to go last gonna happen that day? You know, who's going to go What's last? That? 
the the last people Who's to get that? raptured will be the flat earthers. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I had to say it. Oh. Ouch. Yeah. Dig. Poor flat earthers. So, so, so back to just the rapture itself, it, you know, and yeah. then this, this scripture, Luke 17, 34 through 7 says, where the body is, there the, there the eagles will be gathered together. Well, the eagles are the highest flying birds. So we're talking about high altitudes. That's where the body, our bodies will meet Christ in the air. Um, and as for scriptures that talk about how we're not meant for wrath or for judgment, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 through 10, for God did not appoint us to wrath, you know? Um, and then the Church mm -hmm. of Philadelphia, you know, Revelation three ten, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So in Philadelphia is the Church of Brotherly Love. Now I'm going to throw this in here. Um, so Laodicea comes right after the Church of Philadelphia. So it's this is church number six, church number seven in Jesus's letters, which which John actually sees and hears Jesus himself reading them aloud. Um, so so Laodicea is is told that they are lukewarm they're not hot they're not cold if you were one or the other i could handle it but i want to spit you out of my mouth and then he says something very very interesting he says um behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and comes in and and, and lets me in i will come in and I will sup with him, and he, I will be his God, and you will be my people, right? So he says, he literally says, I'm standing at the door. He's on the outside of this church. He's knocking to get back in. He's knocking to get back into this church. So you've got the church of brotherly love, and then you've got this lukewarm church. What does the word Laodicea mean? People's rights. People's rights. Isn't that the world we live in right now? I've got my rights. Oh, hmm. equity and my rights and my yeah. everybody's screaming for their own rights yep. right now. So stop and think about right. now. Now, when I read those seven churches, I read them from the perspective not of what church I attend. I read them from the perspective of myself as the church, and I see a little bit of myself in almost all of them, which challenges me to repent 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 until i get to that brotherly love church because i certainly don't want to be mm. that that woke church the woke church of my rights my rights my rights or the doctrinal issue, error church i was thinking about this today oh, yeah. it was interesting that you brought that up so pergamum is the church with doctrinal error and i was thinking yeah. you know one of the reasons why you have to love your neighbor as yourself is consider this equation what if you're listening to somebody teaching and they get nine things out of 10 correct? Say we say there's somebody who knows the 10 correct things and the person you're listening to gets nine of those things perfectly correct, but they get one thing wrong. Do you, do you label them according to the one thing they got wrong and invalidate the nine things that they got right? No, truth is truth. Truth withstands scrutiny. It it's, remains true regardless of if somebody packages it with something that's wrong. Now flip that. Now what if they only get one thing right, but they got nine things wrong? The same thing applies. Is they still, truth is still truth. So when it comes to doctrinal error, we all have different pieces and there's parts of those pieces that we don't have right. And there's pieces, the people have pieces that are right. So when you love your neighbor as yourself and you, you listen with a meek heart and study for yourself to show yourself approved unto God, we can, we can learn from each other and we can find those parts that are true. And we can continue to build this puzzle piece because that's what scrutiny is. It, it, it's that flame that burns away the stuff that doesn't, that's not true, that doesn't withstand the heat. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. And, and hopefully those of us who've, who've got eight or nine, can help those mm. of us who who have one or two you know yep. but it it all depends on pride can we lay down our pride can it's tough for some people yeah, exactly you yeah. have to remain humble yeah yep 
So, okay, so where is the prophetic picture of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church? Well, that's in Revelation 4.1. Now think about it. We just got done with the seven churches. John has seen Jesus reading these letters to these churches. And, and you know, uh, five of them got a rebuke and two of them didn't. Mm -hmm. But all of them right. were told to, to repent and to be overcomers. If you overcome, when you overcome, I will give to you this. So, and then the very next thing is John says, Then I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. And the voice said, Come up here. I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like Jasper and Carnelian. And the glow of his em of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. So 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white. They had gold crowns on their heads. Blah, blah, blah. And what is this? What is this? This is the king's chambers. First off, there's a rapture. He was, he was said, T come up here. And a door mm -hmm. was standing open in heaven. Well, this is the Hebrew year 5784 and the Gregorian year 2024. Okay, that four is a dalet in, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew alphabet. And that dalet is the prophetic picture of a door. So here we are in Revelation 4.1. In the year of the door, there's a door in, in uh, the Church of Philadelphia. They're given an open door. There's a closed door in the church of Laodicea that Jesus is desperately knocking on saying, let me in, let me in. And then a door opens up in heaven and John is taken up into this courtroom or into this king's chambers. Is heaven getting ready for a wedding feast? Because we don't hear about the church again until the end of Revelation. The, the church hmm. is never spoken of again. So, um, and Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, right? So, so that right. is, that is the, one of the biggest arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture right there is that Revelation 4, 1, after the seven churches, boom, right there. And then we're in this, this uh, King's Chambers scene in heaven. Mm. Yeah, that doesn't say pre-trib to me, but everybody can translate it differently. I see. I see your point, though, and I, I think it is. It's important to consider these things in the same way that we consider the imagery of the beast coming out of the sea. Is there's there's not just one answer because you have to consider the actual image that is giving uh, that's been that's been yeah. given. So, and this is how God works: is is there's multiple layers and multiple cycles. So it can actually be both things. It could actually be, you know, a, a type of image of the th throne room could be an image of, of the rapture, but it could also be the celestial clock. God is big enough to have built the entire solar system to represent this throne room. And by giving that image, it all, it's also correlating to the celestial clock. So it can actually be more than one thing. And that's the yeah. thing that's like, makes it so hard when you're, when you're reading this is realizing that because people want, they want a linear one answer solution. They don't, exactly. and, and they don't think multiple dimensionally. Well, in four one, um, it, you know, it's God talking to him because God speaks as a trumpet and he says, come up here. I will show you the things which must take place after this. Yeah. After, after this. this. And then you don't and then you don't hear of, of the church anymore. And then the tribulation and all these other things happen. So that is the argument. That is the argument for the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, the there's this other narrative going all throughout the Bible that people absolutely miss. And it is the, uh, the love story between God and man. And um, the Bible is, is absolutely a love story. And we are not headed for death. We are headed for marriage. We are headed for a wedding. We are headed for the greatest relationship of our lives for eternity in heaven. So, but we only see death. <laughs> That's what we say. Oh, my word. No, we are, we are headed for. Well, I don't marriage. see death. That's it's exciting. 
I know. It's super, it's but, super exciting. It's death for the folks that don't believe, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. Well, and for a lot of believers, they, they, they still fear death. I, I and it, for me, it doesn't make any sense, but I, I just know a lot of believers who do, they absolutely fear death. So, um, let's look at the, the Jewish like, wedding feast. Sounds like a lack of faith to me. It's, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, well, a lack of faith or a lack of actually knowing how good God is because maybe they haven't experienced the goodness of God like you and I have, or maybe they just didn't recognize it because, you know, um, I know a lot of people who have had absolutely awful fathers and they can't mm. wrap their mind around a good heavenly father. They just can't do it. Right. Um, and so, so then they do see death. But so, so there is this ongoing narrative throughout the Bible of a wedding feast. And it's not the kind of wedding we here in the West understand. We don't. We have before, to search out the matter. Before we get into the wedding feast, are, are you planning on talking about the woman giving birth as part of the pre evidence for the pre-tribulation? No. No. You talked about that yesterday? or Yeah. I yeah. I, I wanted to. Yeah. I, before we go too far away, I wanted to. Uh, okay. Uh, call back to that and as a reminder to those who may have heard that and uh, call back to those who are in uh, present this to those of you who may not have ever heard this before in second Esdras chapter 4 verse 40 it says so he answered me and said go thy way to the woman with child and ask of her when she have fulfilled her nine months if her womb may keep the birth any longer within her then I said, No, Lord, that can she not. And he said unto me, In the grave, the chambers of souls are like the womb of a woman. For like as a woman that travaileth, maketh haste to escape necessity of travail, even so do these places haste to deliver those things which are committed to them. So you have a reference here in Scripture. So Second Ezra is part of the Bible. It was taken out by the Roman Catholic Church. It is part of the Scripture. It's been part of the Scripture for a very long time. But you have a reference here to the graves being likened to a woman who is pregnant, and that there will come a time where it can no longer hold what it's, <coughs> what's contained, what's been committed to it. So compare that to Revelation 12, 1, the woman who is in pain to be delivered, who delivers up a child. So you could, so that Revelation 12 sign that happened in sept September 23rd, 2017, could have been that warning similar to Noah before build, for building the ark and the, the, the rains coming, you know, sim to, to what we started this with, that could, that sign that we saw could have been a warning that the graves are about to give up those who are in Christ's right so that Absolutely there also it. adds to the yep that, that adds to the pre-tribulation rapture because of revelation 12 that talks about the woman who who the who gives birth and then flees into the wilderness of course it, the woman in this case would be the earth so where would the earth yeah. flee to it's not a perfect analogy but <laughs> you no. get what i'm saying yeah. And it, it was brilliant too. When you brought it up, I, I just about fell out of my chair. I was like, whoa, yeah, I totally yeah. see that. So anyway, let's look at the parable of the, of the Jewish wedding feast. Okay. So it's, okay. let's go to Matthew 22, one through 14. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can read the whole thing for yourself. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Okay. He's giving us a big hint. This whole story, this whole narrative that you've heard your whole life that you don't understand what, what, what your life is all about. It's all about a wedding. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. That's what is happening. God is arranging a marriage for Jesus with his church, with us, with those who want to believe. So it all mm -hmm. begins with the bridegroom. And in Hebrew, that word is katan, C-H-A-T-A-N. So katan. And, that's, and that is literally the one who joins himself to you. Okay. 
So three of the gospel writers recorded Jesus calling himself the bridegroom because it was absolutely integral to who he was. So Matthew 9, 15 says, and Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. So he called himself the bridegroom, mm -hmm. right? Well, mm -hmm. we're born to be the kala, which is the bride, always longing, trying to marry ourselves to something. That's what we do. Drugs, money, uh, other people. We, we're always looking to, for something. Our heart is always looking for something to marry, to follow. Uh, you know, for me, my biggest, my biggest idol in my life is my purpose. What am I supposed to be doing for God? You know, and I have to tell myself, whoa, you know, that's a calling. It's not an altar. You know, so, so we are, we're all longing to marry ourselves to something if we don't recognize Jesus as our katan, right? So Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, husbands love your life, your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water and the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish so right here he's telling us who the bride is it's his church it's you it's me because each of us in ourselves are the temple of god we are each his church hey let me inter interrupt real quick mm -hmm. hey, kids in the chat be nice to each other you know uh it, Someone's calling someone a pagan and an imposter. Look, it's okay to disagree, but guys, it's you can disagree through love and patience. Just because someone has a different perspective doesn't mean they're a pagan and an imposter. And we're definitely not going to bring them to Christ if we're acting condescending to them. We have to just provide love and understanding. We, we don't call yep. each other names, guys. We have to be patient. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We have to love others into the kingdom. And and honestly, the people in the chat that are putting those kind of things that, that you're disagreeing with, um, they're pre-Christians. If they're not pre-Christians, <laughs> they're prisoners of war. So, so here we we're go. All, we're, all <laughs> we're all members. We're all members. We're all members in particular. Some of us are farts. Yeah, guys, you just you have to understand <laughs> it, when it was good <laughs> when it comes to yeah. helping others. Think about how Jesus helped the unbelievers. He didn't beat them over the head with the scripture. He he just presented them with love and patience, and all you can yep. do is provide them love and understanding and eventually the truth will be revealed to them but beating them stoning them with scripture is not going to fix anything yeah and calling right. names is never going to bring somebody into the kingdom of god it's not yeah so so what we have right here is we have have uh jesus himself telling us that the the church is the bride right so, mm -hmm. or actually that's Ephesians. That's uh, that's Paul letting us know that the church is the bride and Jesus has called himself the bridegroom. And he's already said the kingdom of God is like a man, a king throwing a, a feast, a wedding feast for his son. Right. So and let's there's look an at the honorable, parable. there's an honorable, there's an honorable mention here to Psalm 19. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork day unto day utter speech night unto night showeth knowledge. And it talks about it being as the, the message is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, running the race for the marriage. That's right. You are going to find the, the uh, prophetic picture of a wedding all the way through scripture. And, and it's funny because once once we get done and I show this to you and you start reading scripture, you will see it everywhere. You will see it everywhere. And I'm, I'm only yeah. going to touch on some of the verses. So we've got the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. This is really controversial and everybody's going to fight over what it really means. And we really don't know. We really don't know. But it's, it's food for thought. That's Matthew 25, 1 through 13. 
Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Okay, so we've got ten virgins, ten good girls, ten brides. Ten brides. They're not um, bridesmaids. They are brides. Ten brides going to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took nor oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, we're back to that nighttime <laughs> in, in Israel. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give me some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But you go, rather, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. So let's stop there for just a second. So what, what is the oil in the lamp? Well, one prophetic picture of, of what is the oil in the lamp would be the oil of the Holy Spirit. Are you mm -hmm. filled with the Holy Spirit? Does he live in you? Do you have a religion? And the other one is the intimacy of, with the Lord. Do you know the Lord? Does he know you? And that, check this out. So the door was shut. Now here's the deal. Once in, in a Jewish wedding feast, when they shut the door, it's shut for seven days. No one leaves. No one comes in. Seven days. Hmm. Think about that. So afterward, the other virgins came also, and they said, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he answered, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Hmm. I do not know you. It's not you do not know me. I do not know you. So the question here is, do we have knowledge of God? Do we have knowledge of our bridegroom, Jesus? Or do we have a relationship with him? Does he know us? Because that's what he says. I do not know you. You know, because I, I mean, right. I always think of these these people that we know, uh, that we think we know. You know, uh, Taylor Swift or um, uh, Kevin Costner. We can read all about these sports figures, these Hollywood stars, and we can feel like we know them, but we don't. We don't know them. We don't have a relationship back and forth. And we can easily do that with the Lord as well. We can know the Bible back and forth. We can go on mission trips. But did we allow him to know us? Was hmm. there a back and forth relationship? So that's that's the scary part right there. <laughs> so yeah. my I guess actually, is... These, I actually have a teaching called the scariest, verse, uh, scariest scripture in the Bible. Uh, scariest scriptures in the Bible, and one of them is him not knowing you. Yeah. Yes. I don't know you. What? But I know you, Lord. I know you. Right. Hey, I did all these things in your name. Why are you sending me away? Well, because you knew of me, but you never let me know you. Oh, boy. So, so the rapture of the church is a picture of the seven day wedding feast guys. So the father it, in, in this wedding feast, what happens is the father chooses the bride. He chooses the bride, which of course, again, is that, that Hebrew word kala, which means to complete, or it means daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. <laughs> daughter-in-law. That's kind of funny. So it's already from the father's perspective. So the father chooses the bride, and then he and the son humbly go to the gates of the city where they meet with the bride and the bride's father, probably mother too, but father definitely. And that is where, you know, and, and the city gate is where all of the legal things in the Jewish uh, culture happened. Lot sat at the city gates. He was a big wig within the city. He was a judge or, or something. Of, of the sort. So that's where all the legal things happened. That's where people hung out because they wanted to know what was going on. Right. And so that is where anything legal happened. And so in a Jewish wedding, the father and the son go to the city gate. They meet with the, the bride and her father. 
and they lay out the covenant. They lay out the the list of things that this girl's going to get. Um, uh, uh, the contract. It's a contract, for lack of a better word, I guess. So, and what he is presenting her is absolutely everything he owns. That's what he's presenting to her, and he's saying, "This is everything I am. This is everything I will ever have, and everything that, I, and I'm offering it all to you." That's what he's doing in this wedding contract. And she has the ability to say no and keep everything. But most girls are going to see that and they're going to go. Okay, they're going to say yes. So, the Ten Commandments are a prophetic picture of this marriage contract. Okay? Um, they are not law. They are love. The Ten Commandments are not law. They are love. The first four are where God says, I love you over all the other nations of the world, so please do not have any lovers. No statues, no pictures, don't have, don't have any, but isn't that what you would want of your husband or your wife? Please don't have any other lovers. Don't cheat on me. No statues, no pictures of your former girlfriends, no magazines of people that you're, you're fantasizing about. And then the second command, don't take my name in vain. That's our name. That's what God is saying. I'm giving you my name. So now it's our name. Don't bring shame to it by living in a way that that um, uh, is shameful to us. Don't misuse our name. And commandments three and four are all about find time to love me and get to know me for who I'm, I really am. And then those last six commands uh, are can be summed up in love our family, love our family so we can all get along and live together. So the ten commandments are not legalism. They are love. They were a wedding contract. And if you go back and you start reading in chapter 19, you'll see that it was a wilderness wedding. The people cleansed themselves. They, the contract was laid out before, him and, uh, before them. And as a nation, they all said, we will. They said, we do. So God himself married the nation of Israel right there. And what did they do? <laughs> They immediately cheated on him. <laughs> immediately cheated on him. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. but that's, yeah. Yep. So, All so right. just like that. Yeah. So, just like that, the bride, the bride to be accepts the gifts. She agrees to the terms and conditions. And to approve the message, the, the marriage contract, they have a, a cup of wine. And once they have that cup of wine together at the city gates in front of everybody who's there to watch, who now know that there's a wedding coming, which would have been the biggest event ever. You know, there was, it's not like they could go to the movies or a concert. There was like, whoa, there's a wedding coming. That's going to be a seven day feast. I want to go. So, so everyone would have been there and they would have seen them drink this glass of wine. And at that, that glass of wine, they are now married. They are absolutely contracted and married. Well, what was Jesus's first miracle? Turning water into wine. His first Where? public miracle. At a Where? wedding. At a wedding. Hmm. At a wedding. What was he saying? Look, I'm the bridegroom. I'm here. Hmm. I'm taking water. I'm going to turn it into wine. It's, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to turn you into something fruitful for me. Interesting. That's, Yeah. So spirit, the, the gift of Holy spirits, um, compared to water also, that's why John the Baptist baptized with water. Mm -hmm. So turning that, that, that cleansing water into a covenant of, um, commitment, a covenant between husband and wife. Wow. See, there's not just one answer guys. Yeah. There's so many I layers. Know. And, yeah, so it's, and very it's so fun to seek them out. It's so fun to, to seek them all out and, and know how rich our God is and that there's always more to look for. And that's why he says, I never knew you. I don't, we don't have a relationship. You really didn't search for me other than you listened to what other people said and you read this black in the word and you never actually looked for what I was really trying to say. So... Mm -hmm. And here's the really cool part. So, so we know that the bride and the groom take this first cup at the, at the city gates. 
Matthew 26, 27 through 29 is the Last Supper. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant. Mm -hmm. What, what, what? A new covenant? Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. That new covenant is one of the reasons why I changed my terminology to having a covenant with Christ um, mm -hmm. rather than just saying, you know, being saved or being born again, because it's deeper than that, that it's, it's a commitment, uh, mm -hmm. a two way commitment. Yeah. Just like a marriage. And, and, and we like to say, I'm a believer. I'm, I believe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, it's we're in covenant. We have mm -hmm. agreed to something. And here's something funny. I mean, let's let's get a little blurry here. Um, when he said, this is my blood. OK, this is the second time he said, this is my blood. Actually, he's saying it here with with the disciples. But um, when the crowds were coming to him all the time and and, you know, he was getting really it was hurting him he was he was getting discouraged and hurt because they were there for dinner and a show and so he said something really uh i mean it just shocked them when he said unless you can eat my drink my blood and eat my body you should not follow me and these people hmm. they just stopped and they what was that all about well what did the fallen angels and the watchers expect of those who followed them? Drinking blood. The, the, are you referring to the blood covenant? Ew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. So Jesus is saying when he says, this is my blood of a new covenant, he's saying two different things. Hmm, that's There's interesting. two different layers of this. He's talking about this new covenant with man. That that and you know the New Testament. This is this is a different kind of a wedding. This is a different kind of a marriage. But he's also saying, demonic realm, you are being being put on notice. You've hmm. been doing this to people for this long. I'm giving them a better sacrifice. I'm well, giving sure. them something better. Because the and so the demonic realm was like, whoa. <laughs> well, well, the whole purpose of the demonic realm was to prevent his birth. So mm -hmm. he's letting them know what time it is. You know, he knew that they had had a covenant to prevent him from coming to earth. So it's a, uh, you make a good point. And I love hmm. this because, you know, the, the demonic realm, if, if you really study it, Jesus is constantly putting the demonic realm on notice. Uh, most of the parables he's actually talking to them too um it's it's crazy but uh so anyway um the groom so here's here, so that's what he was talking about he was he was talking about two different things this covenant is a new covenant with mankind and his blood is a better sacrifice than that the what the demons had given them had given people so so here's the deal so the groom immediately goes back to his father's house and he starts building his bride's dream house. That's what he starts. He starts building a house onto his father's house. And what does John 14, 2 say? In my father's house, there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Hebrews mm -hmm. 3, 3 through 4. But Jesus is worthy to receive a much greater glory than Moses. For the one who builds a house deserves to be honored more than the house he builds. Every house is built by someone, but God is the designer and builder of all things. So he's talking about going and building a house for us. And here's the deal. The bride doesn't know when he's going to come back. She has no idea. Could be a year, could be six months, could be two years. Wh how big is the house? How amazing is it? Um, we don't know. She doesn't know. So um, Revelation 3.3 3 says, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I come. So in, in the brides, the bridesmaids, the virgins, they get the bride and themselves ready for his return every day, every day. So um, they, they go out, they do all the shopping, they get her, her, everything together for her, and then they dress up, they put on their makeup, they do their hair every day, 
into the night with their lamps going because they don't know when he's coming. And when he shows up, she has to be ready. She can't say, excuse me, I'm going to go take a shower now. She has hmm. to be ready to go right then. So she is literally sleeping in her wedding clothes along with her bridesmaids. Um, Revelation Gross. 16, 15 <laughs> <laughs> is behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Keeps his hmm. garments. They're sleeping in their garments, lest he be naked and they see his shame. So, so again, the wedding feast is the biggest thing happening. And everyone he wanted to be there. And so the whole town knows that a wedding's about to take place. So they're watching. They're waiting, too. And what does Revelation 16, 9 say? It says, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? So if you were at the mm -hmm. gate and you heard that, and you, you're welcome. So when the groom finishes building the house, here's the next thing that happens. The father has to inspect it. And while the house might be perfect and ready to go, the father still has to prepare the feast. So only the father knows when all these arrangements are finished. And that's when he tells his son, now you can go get your bride. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but the father only. Because right. he's the one that knows when everything's prepared. Well, the bridegroom, he dresses. He dresses as a king with a crown. They journey at night. That's the, they love to come at night. That's kind of the, the deal. They journey at night in a torchlit procession to go get the bride. And he and his groomsmen usually, usually want to, they, they call it stealing the bride away from her parents. Well, 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And as they pass by, as they go through the towns, they blow trumpets they are, they are they are celebrating. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. They're blowing the trumpets. And all those who are in the village who wake up and hear that get in the procession because they, hmm. they want to go to the party. So, and that's 1 Corinthians 15, 52 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. These people... <laughs> they get up and they they got their clothes and they're ready to go you know so if you know if this is you you know receive that invitation you know that trumpet going by is an invitation to them i can go too um da, 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 da. oh yeah hebrews 3 1 and so dear brothers and sisters you're now made holy each of you is invited to the feast of your heavenly calling the feast of your heavenly calling. Wow. So hmm. when they arrive at the bride's home in this, in this Jewish wedding feast, this is the way it goes. You are, they arrive at the bride's home. The groomsmen uh, put the bride in a special chair that they carry on their shoulders. And they call this the catching away, which is hmm. the Greek word harpazo, which is in 1 Thessalonians. That is the word for catching away. They were caught up. Harpazo. It's a rapture. It's, it's a, it means rapture. So they are caught up together. Um, they call it the catching away. And then they fly her back to the groom's house. They literally fly her back is what they call it. That's First Thessalonians. Cool. Yeah. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be with the Lord forever. So that's what is happening. She's being caught up. She's flying back to meet with him and be with him forever. So if you're not in the wedding party when they arrive at the father's house, the door is closed and nobody gets in for seven days, right? Well, Matthew 7, seven days, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? We cast out demons. We've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Speaking I of, speaking never of, knew you. Oh, that's awesome. Speaking of scripture, do um, <clears throat> are, are we going to um, finish the scripture? We've been on topic now for about an hour and a half. I don't mean to cut anybody off, but well, actually, we did. We did kind of change topic, but okay. 
Because now we're on the, the Jewish wedding feast. Just <laughs> what is the prophetic picture? Well, what is the prophetic picture of, of, of the rapture? What is that? So no, first you're, we talked about the right. tribulation, but now, now just what, why do we miss the rapture in scripture? Because we don't see this picture mm -hmm. because we don't see this picture. Uh, so, so right. Yeah. And at the, at the feast, the bride and the groom, they have their second cup of wine. And that is, that is the end. Now here's the cool thing. The first cup is that cup of sanctification, right? The second cup that Jesus took was the cup of judgment. He did not drink of the cup with his followers at the, the um, uh, Last Supper because he drank the cup of judgment. Yeah. Instead, he took our sins. They drank the first cup. His, his first cup was our judgment so that this, his second cup will be in heaven, just like he told them, with their second cup, with our second cup. So the choice to be the bride is yours. It absolutely is. There's one more thing, and I'll have you guys look this one up yourself. Okay? Look this one up yourself. I double dog dare you. It's Matthew 21, 1 through 4. And it's the oh, 1 through 14. It's the parable of the wedding feast. And in this parable, parable, he's giving us a word picture. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is just like this. He's pointing to something that we can see and know and saying, this is what I'm trying to tell you. This is what I'm about. This is what heaven's about. And he talks about <clears throat> a king who uh, is putting together the wedding feast for his son and he sends out all the invitations and people are just too busy. They're too burdened to come. Is that you? Are you too busy, too burdened? Are you are you focusing on the world instead of him? I dare you to read Matthew 21, 1 through 4. So <laughs> anyway, that is the prophetic picture of the Jewish wedding feast. And that is the picture of the rapture of the church. The whole the whole Bible is about a wedding. It's really about God loving his people and redeeming us because he wants a bride for his son and we're yeah. it wow and you know in uh matthew matthew um 15 i think matthew 7 15 and this kind of points to the folks in the chat that are um casting stones but it's really you will know them by their fruits Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even though every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will know them by their fruits. So keep that in mind, you know, guys in the chat, when, you know, you're trying to correct each other or you do it with love and kindness because you will know them by their fruits. Just because they get something wrong or they may be off scripture doesn't mean their fruit is bad. Just means that they need to be guided the right way. So, but you don't want to be the person that stones someone with scripture and you know, it's it's tough for people to listen and learn if whoever's presenting the correction appears to have bad fruit. Yeah. Yeah. And and as far as we're concerned, I mean, if if you are looking at what we're teaching, or what we're talking about, and you're like, eh, um, wait a minute, just listen, just listen and walk away and, and go check, go look it up, look for yourself. What if we have a, a revelation or a piece of knowledge that you've never been exposed to before? I'm going to tell you the truth. I was raised in the Lutheran church. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. I went to the Lutheran church by myself. My parents didn't raise me in anything, but, um, 
I, I had to go to volleyball camp to get saved because the Lutheran church was never going to tell me that I needed a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I just needed to, you know, check the box that I was a member of the church. And so I got saved at volleyball camp and, um, I did go to a really cool spirit filled four square when I was in high school. But when I became an adult and my husband got saved, who came out of, you know, he's Japanese. So coming out of a, more of a Buddhist tradition, I knew that taking him to a spirit filled church would freak him out. So we went to a Baptist church. Well, I'm not disparaging the Baptists. I learned my Bible like nobody's business in the Baptist church, but I certainly did not learn anything about prophecy. And I would have laughed you silly if you would have told me that there was this Jewish wedding feast and it's the prophetic picture of the rapture of the church and that the whole Bible is really about a wedding. I would have laughed you silly and said, where does it say that? Where's the exact scripture? Um, thank God the Lord delivered me from that religious spirit that says, if it's not in black and white, in the words I want to see, uh, you're wrong. So, yes, that's I my agree. testimony. <laughs> no, Amen. it's awesome. You know, love, you know, it, folks that are, that come to this channel often know that Watchful and I, uh, our concept and teaching is simple. It's just love. Have a personal relationship with Christ and just yep. lead with love. It's that simple. Everything else falls naturally into place. If you keep those two simple concepts together, Christ will never steer yeah, you he, wrong. He'll never steer you wrong. Mm -hmm. Never. Yeah, and you may not see it. You may not see it because we're not at each other's throats, but we have a lot of disagreements. There are, oh, yeah, we all yeah, believe different things. Yeah. But we're, we're here studying together to see what we can learn from each other. And we're respectfully listening to each other's, you know, their, the work that they've put into studying the scripture so that we can increase our learning. We're not at each other's throats saying you're wrong because I believe differently. Uh, you know, that's not loving. It's just yeah. Not. It, it, watchful and I, we talk every day, sometimes many times a day. And half of the time we talk, we disagree with each other, but we don't stone each other. We yeah. both yeah. respect each other's perspective and, and sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong, but I learn yep. from it. I learn through every interaction, and together we grow. I can't tell you how much stuff I've learned from Watchful that I had wrong at one point. And that's the whole point yep. of fellowship, guys. It's the whole point of the fellowship. It's all yeah. our whole purpose of being here is learning yep. together through this fellowship and there would be no fellowship if the love was not here. If we were nasty right. towards each other, this would not work. And you guys would not keep coming back if the chat was toxic, which is why I constantly get on to those who, you know, can't lead with love when they're trying to correct folks. Because that's not the way. That's not how Jesus would do it. Sorry. Well, and it's not our job to correct folks. It's not our job. Yeah, I mean, if right. someone's blatantly leading someone down the wrong path, you know, you can gently uh, let the chat know that, hey, this isn't right. But Jesus will sort that person out himself. You know, if they're wrong, that doesn't mean in a week they will still be wrong because every night we teach. And the longer folks are here, the more... They learn and understand, and the more we learn and understand. So it's just growing together. Yeah, and and you'll notice we allow people all around us who disagree with us, you know, some on various levels, and we we encourage that kind of behavior. Disagree with us, but do it respectfully. As soon as you as soon as you start to spam the chat or you know make it so no one else can listen or talk, that's when we have a problem. That's when we start turning over the tables. Well, yeah. and honestly, you can be so engrossed in the chat that you miss the teaching. What are you here for? Are you here to just yeah. get in the chat and, and, and correct people? I mean, that's not a ministry. That's not a ministry. A ministry is to love people into the kingdom. Jesus didn't come for a what. 
He came for a who. Who who are we supposed to love into the kingdom? If you're in the chat, love these people into the kingdom. Hey, here's a comment. So how can you teach if you allow everything to be heard? There you go, Watchful. There's one for you. I'll comment when you're done. How, how can, can you, you teach, teach if you allow every? Yeah, how can you teach if you allow everything to be heard? Well, I I put that back on you. How can you hear if you're constantly interrupting? So if you're constantly telling somebody, oh, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that, and you're not actually listening to what they're saying, you're you're only listening to what's in your head and looking for an opportunity to speak up and interrupt. Uh, listening, so teaching. And there's there's plenty of scriptures in the uh, in, you know about this about listening and you know increasing your learning and the fool uh, doesn't listen. I mean Proverbs is all about that. And even yeah. you know look at uh, there's a lot of stuff in the in in the New Testament too. Uh, so it's <clears throat> use your spiritual discernment. You know if somebody's just way out to lunch on something, Maybe it's not something that you want to listen to. I mean, we've we've had a, a very broad spectrum on on our show, and you know there are some people that we allow to you know speak with speak is with things that we don't agree with, but we interject. Uh, and and there's those that you know we mildly disagree with. It's a walk. It's a discernment. You know, if somebody's up here, you know, talking about you know witchcraft and you know, trying to get people to worship Satan. We're not going to allow that. That's not what this channel is about. We're here to bring people into a covenant with, with the Messiah. But if somebody is saying, you know, things that we don't, you know, agree with, or in a way that we don't agree, it's something that I've learned. We're old. All of us are old here. <clears throat> something that I have learned is so many disagreements come down to saying the same thing different ways. So Absolutely. when you're so quick to try and and prove your way or the words that you use to describe something, you're you're more likely to miss that somebody is literally agreeing with you. They're just using different words. And that what was that that was what was happening in the chat earlier. Someone was um, arguing with someone named Tyler, and I think they were both essentially saying the same things. They were just saying it different ways. And you were spending all that time and energy to make a point. Whereas we make our position very clear here. We may allow other people to have a platform, but our story never changes. We teach and stick to the word of God. And then we may agree or disagree with whoever's on the show, but we always circle back around with our position. Bottom line is you use discernment with everything that you hear. Fact check everything, everything, yeah. but our position doesn't change. It's we have the same position no matter what, and it's all based off the word of God. So you take the key nuggets that you hear and you research it yourself. And if folks have right. questions, we answer those questions and give our reasons why. And there are also moderators before. for the chat. You don't have to be a moderator. You're, you know, we, we want you to come here and, and listen and learn and let the moderators do the moderating. And, and yeah, that's, that's, that's just me though. All right. So do we want to, um, watchful, do you want to, um, read some of the commandments? Yeah, so this is kind of appropriate. So the next section we're in is Exodus 12, and there's 15 different commandments in here. So we could go from uh, all the way, we could read the entire thing, or we could just read part of it. And uh, it's this is the Passover. This is when the children of Israel came out, and it talks about the Passover. So how appropriate. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's pretty cool. Do you want to read or do you want me to read? Well, I can do a little today. How about I do a couple and then you can pick up. All right. Wait, okay. Exodus 12, what? Just 12? I'm just going to, I'm just going to start in one. Cause it's like, okay. there's like 15 commandments in here. Got it. So I'll just, we're probably not going to read all of 12, but we'll just keep going. All right. Now the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you speak to all the congregation of Israel saying 
On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him, next to his house, take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's needs, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Its head, with its legs and its entrails, you shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn it with fire, and thus shall you eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Interesting. It's it's neat to actually actually hear that. And broken down. Hmm. So the commandments that are in there are uh, this month shall be to you the beginning of months. So this is the first of the month. Uh, you calendar. shall keep it until the four. Yep. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. So shall kill it at twilight. Um, they shall eat the flesh that night roasted with fire with unleavened bread. So he's basically giving instructions on what to do. So these fall under commandments. Now they're, they're you know, in the same, you know, vein. So the, this is this is often what's referred to as the law. Now, do we have to keep these things exactly like this in a legalistic sense? Some of the things are very beneficial, uh, but some of the things you have to filter through loving God and loving your neighbor. So that's how the one who perfectly fulfilled the Torah taught us to filter these things, all, all right, the law on. and the prophets. Sorry. We, uh, uh, anti antichrist superstar. Come on, man. Uh, I understand you're making points, but you know, telling someone just to read their Bible and why did God require animal sacrifice and child genital mutilation and circumcision? If you read your Bible, you would know those answers. But, you know, be kind. We're not here to be derogatory toward each other. If you have a question, we'll yeah. gladly answer it. But that's not even what we're talking about right now. Yeah, so this is this is the Passover. This is what the Messiah did. So this is the 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 this is a foreshadowing of what Yeshua was did. And there this is God giving a commandment for replicating this this keeping in remembrance so that they could recognize when he came. And many of them didn't rec- they had been ful- they had been doing this for years and many of them didn't recognize when he came even when they were doing this when he was the actual sacrifice and being the blood uh, on the on the on the doorposts, so that the the death would pass over. This is how he saved us. This is what this is representing. This is God commanding this feast, so that we could be in remembrance, so that we could recognize, and then after it happens, to continue to remember. Very well said. Yeah, Jesus definitely fulfilled this on the cross. Yeah, that's what's awesome. And the the really crazy thing is that on the Passover at at different times of the day, the priests are singing specific psalms. And Mm -hmm. at the time when Jesus actually died, the psalm that they were singing, I can't remember which one it was specifically. I can look it up. Um, But it was actually they were singing about the death of the sacrifice as he was dying and they still did not see it yeah still did not see it well you know many are blinded by the god of this world and some people just don't understand that 
So this is probably a good place to switch over to the prophecies. You want to handle the prophecies being fulfilled? Yeah. Um, I didn't have my book, so I'll go into the one I understand the best. And one of the, you know. Center. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have a whole book for all this stuff. Um, and I ha- I got this book specifically for this topic. We haven't talked about this topic for a month. I brought my book to work with me, not thinking we would even talk about it, left it there to read. And of course, the <laughs> one day I brought it and left it <laughs> we somewhere. We decided to start doing this. We decided to start doing this. The the biggest prophecy that marks the end times in my eyes is the formation of Israel in 1948 as it went 2,700 mm-hmm. years without being a nation. And God, Christ simply said that the formation of Israel would mark the last generation to see his return. So that is one of my favorite prophecies that is fulfilled. And that's through several different verses. I was paraphrasing with that statement, but that's essentially what it says. Yeah, where's that? That is a uh, that's Isaiah sixty six eight. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Sh- shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? There's a for- there's a reference back to what we talked about in Second es- Esdras, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. And then there's the fig tree. Wow. Med- there's a fig tree verse that talks about uh, the formation of Israel as well. Again, I don't have my notes in front of me. I've, um, I'd have to look and see. But that's one of my favorite, and there's so many. There's really so many. I I came unprepared for this because I'd been waiting to talk about this for months, and then all my <laughs> notes are somewhere else. But there's been so many. That's prophecies. how God works. He wants he wants to know how much you remember. <laughs> yeah, but there's been so many prophecies fulfilled. I think there yeah. was some number of 200 and something that Jesus fulfilled just through his walk from the age of 30 to 33. There was a, a, just a whole slew of them that were in the old Testament that he fulfilled in just that three year walk. Um, and I have them all written down, but, uh, We'll start going through this at the end of each show, guys. We're going to continue to read scripture at the end of the show. And we'd like to talk about fulfilled prophecy just a little at a time. Because I love the the talk of fulfilled prophecy. You know, when you talk about stuff. Oh, um, well, you know how we were just talking about the song that that was uh, being sung as Jesus was dying. That's a fulfilled prophecy, too. Is it really? I would just tell you all. Mm. Yeah. Go read Psalms 118. That is what the they were singing in the temple as Jesus was dying on the cross on the mount. And what does it say? Uh, it talks about salvation. The voice of uh, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Then we come down to the stone which the builders rejected has become the fir- the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. Mm. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad it is. Save now, I pray, O Lord. They were literally, this this Psalms 118 was being fulfilled as they were singing it, and they still missed him. Yeah. And guys, uh, that's incredible. For some of the new folks in the chat, everything we talk about comes out of here. This doesn't come out of the thin air or something we listen to on another YouTube video or something that was taught to us at a church. Everything we have a reference point is in this book. And we all, uh, all three of us really live in the scripture. I love reading the Bible. So all our talking points, we anchor in the word of God. So it just food for thought for anybody that was... um, wondering where we get our talking points and our information. We have only one source and it's in the scripture. And, you know, that's why we're here is to provide that information to you guys, because we believe that the truth is very relevant now because the deception is thick folks. It is super thick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So go read Psalms 118. (laughs) Yep. 
But uh, what we'll start doing, though, uh, going forward is at the end of each show, we'll read two more commandments and then we'll cover two prophecies fulfilled. I feel like it'd be fun and yeah. learning. Uh, I love reading scripture. So hopefully you guys aren't bothered by reading the Bible. Some people like it. Some people don't. But I can sit here and read all night. Do you guys have anything else? No, we may actually start a channel of just reading scripture. It was the I did a a uh, post on that on our community wall and it was the most responded to post that we've had since we started the show was reading oh, scripture cool. it literally there was uh, um it was an enormous number of people that responded normally we get you know maybe a hundred people respond it's it, it was enormous um, um wow. a lot Which of people, reminds me Go to our website and register. If you want to support what we're doing here, we're building a lot of things. So we want yes. to build channels like that. We, uh, we're our website. You can see how it's starting to form. Uh, it's not just this channel. We want to bring in other channels so that you have a good selection. So if you want to, you know, want to put on us reading in the background, uh, you know, we want to do that. You know, we want to build a studio so that we can actually all be together in a studio and actually. Uh, you know, be fellowship that way and bring that kind of content to you. So if you want to support our, our mission, go to the website, register as a member. You don't have to right now. There's no difference in any of the different membership levels. Uh, if you want to support us financially, you're welcome to. Uh, we're going to be bringing more features to the website. We're going to be everything that that goes into this mission is is supporting this mission. So if you like what we're doing and you want to see more of it, Please support us, even if it's just registering for free so that we have a way of contacting you in the event that we get censured or removed. If you want to continue to receive this content. So please go to the website, sign up there. And Watchful has been building a app and it is awesome, yep. guys. It is awesome. It, it, I posted uh, a couple pictures, but it is really awesome. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but he's, there you uh, go. he's building some really cool stuff on this app. Huh? Hey, there now we are right there. Apps. But yeah, but yep. it's so basically, it's got, yeah. So it's a, it's a video, it's a video focused app. We want to be able to make it kind of like Netflix to where you can kind of pick what you want to watch. You can put together playlists, watch lists, stuff like that. The blog We're also going to build in there. a community in there. We're going to build in a community. We're going to build in live chat, which will have end-to-end -end encryption uh, so that you can securely That's talk cool. without the fear of being monitored. So lots of things coming. So if you if you want to support what we're doing, go sign up on the on the website. Yeah, it's uh, guys, it's going to be awesome. It's essentially going to be our own ecosystem where all of our videos, our blog will be there, our merchandise store will be there. Most importantly, you guys will have a community that will require a login so you don't get random bots showing up in the chat or folks that just want to stir up trouble. This will be a private community for everybody in our community where you can go and you know it'll be a, a social platform, the whole ball of wax, and it'll be just us without all the outside interference. So I'm really excited because we like being with all you guys. We enjoy the fellowship. But everybody have a good night. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. It's, um, it's the Sabbath night, so we won't be on the show. We may or may not be on Saturday night. We always kind of leave that open. I'll post something during Saturday day if we're going to be on. But if not, we'll see you guys Sunday night. Shalom, and shalom. Everybody have a great shalom. night. Thank you so much for being here. Good night, guys. Bye-bye.